After gallbladder surgery, it's normal to be left with a lot of questions. How is my digestive system supposed to work now? How exactly is my liver connected to the rest of the digestive process without the gallbladder? What kinds of consequences might show up over time? Or maybe you are wondering, was it one of those not-so-necessary parts we can live easily without? And of course, the big question, how do you keep the rest of your digestive tract healthy after surgery? And what to do if after the surgery you are faced with the same problems – nausea, bloating, diarrhea and abdominal pain? Stay with me until the end of the video and I'll share you some little-known recommendations that many doctors don't usually talk about but they can make a huge difference in how you feel after surgery. Gallstone disease has quietly turned into a modern epidemic. Back in the 1970s, about a quarter of a million gallbladders were removed every year in the United States. By the 1990s, the number doubled – half a million surgeries annually – and is still increasing. Why is this happening? Well, take a look around. Our diets keep getting worse our eating habits more irregular, and stress, of course. All of these are direct hits to your gallbladder. And in many cases, the damage becomes so serious that removing it is the only option left. But the surgery is not the end of the story. In some ways, it's just the beginning. Because once the gallbladder is gone, your digestive system has to adapt. And if you don't help it, you might have problems. Protecting your digestion after gallbladder removal doesn't actually start with your stomach or your liver, it starts right here with your mouth. Before we dive in, make sure you are subscribed. And if your friends or family are dealing with this same issue, share this video with them, it could really help them. So let's talk about what actually happens after you go for a gallbladder removal. Once the gallbladder is gone, your liver connects directly to your gut the very first part of your intestine, right after the stomach. The liver still produces bile, of course, but this bile is not the same as it was when the gallbladder was still around. Without that storage tank, the bile becomes less concentrated, more watery and more liquid, but it tends to act more aggressively on your intestines. Now you might think, once the gallbladder is removed, all those painful attacks should stop. No more sharp pain in the upper right abdomen, no more nausea or diarrhea. But for many people, the symptoms don't disappear. They continue to struggle with the same issues they had before surgery. Gallstone disease doesn't just appear overnight. It usually develops slowly, over many years. During that time, your gallbladder was already suffering. Bile flow was disrupted. And little by little, your entire digestive system had to adapt. Every organ in that system took on extra work to compensate for the gallbladder malfunction. So when the gallbladder is finally removed, its function is gone. And that means the burden on the remaining organs gets even heavier. Even though the gallbladder is gone, the bile duct that connects the liver and duodenum remains. Unfortunately, you can run into problems right there too. First of all, the duct may become permanently narrowed. Even without gallbladder, a stone can form directly inside the duct, blocking the flow of the bile. Sometimes the bile itself becomes too thick, making it hard to pass through the narrow duct. And then there is something many people don't realize – a problem with the sphincter. Bile doesn't just flow freely into the duodenum on its own. At the end of the bile duct, there is a tiny circular muscle called the sphincter. It opens and closes the duct, releasing bile exactly when it's needed for digestion. But this sphincter can malfunction. Stress, hormonal changes or imbalances in intestinal signaling molecules – all this can disrupt its work. And if it doesn't open when it should, bile gets stuck. Instead of flowing into the intestine, it starts baking up into the liver. And that's a real problem. Bile isn't just for digesting fats. It also helps the body get rid of waste, leftover medications, toxic byproducts of metabolism, and the breakdown products of hemoglobin. If bile can't exit properly, those substances don't leave the liver. They pile up, and over time, the liver itself begins to suffer. The result – inflammation and potentially long-term liver damage. After your gallbladder is removed, the very nature of your bile changes. 
it's no longer the same as before. And quite often, when the bile flows into the intestine, it actually starts to irritate the intestinal lining. Because its composition is different, bile can throw off the balance of gut bacteria. Harmful microbes start multiplying. This can trigger inflammation in the gut. Over time, that inflammation can stretch the sphincter, these little muscle or wolves that control the duct from the pancreas and liver. Sphincters weaken and the contents of the intestine start to leak back into the ducts. And what's inside the intestines? Partially digested food mixed with digestive enzymes. And that's dangerous because enzymes aren't supposed to flow backwards. When they do, they can begin to damage the pancreas itself, literally digest it. So inflammation in the intestines can quickly cause inflammation of the pancreas. Also, many people develop another issue after surgery, fat intolerance. Fatty foods cause diarrhea. It's one of the most common consequences of gallbladder removal. All of these problems together are grouped under one medical term, postcholecystectomy syndrome. To put it simply, it's a set of symptoms that may show up after gallbladder removal. Sometimes it begins right after the surgery, sometimes years later, and there are lucky people who never develop it at all. So what can you actually do to help yourself? Believe it or not, the answer begins in your mouth. The digestive process doesn't just start in the stomach. It starts with your teeth, tongue, and saliva. And this step is often underestimated. Bad teeth, poor chewing, jaw joint tissues, or just the modern habit of eating fast, swallowing large chunks of food. The very first step is to lighten the load on your stomach and other digestive organs. Chew your food well. Don't swallow big chunks. If you don't, the stomach has to work much harder. Food stays there longer. Digestion slows down. And every organ in the digestive system ends up under extra stress. Yes, I know, it's not easy to change how you chew, but it matters. Pay attention the next time you eat. Focus on how well you are breaking down your food. Give yourself time, at least 30 minutes per meal. Remember, your saliva isn't just moisture. It contains enzymes that actually begin the process of digestion right in the mouth. By chewing properly and mixing food well with saliva, you help your stomach and intestines. The second point is to eat small portions. It's simply too hard for your body to digest a large amount of food all at once. The smaller the portion, the better your digestive system can handle it. If you eat just a small portion, the enzymes and bile are usually enough to process food properly. Next point is try to eat on a schedule. When your body gets used to meal times, your digestive system actually prepares in advance. Digestive juices, saliva, enzymes, and bile start being produced at the right time, just before your lunch or dinner, if you have them at the exact time every day. It's a reflex. Your body expects food, and it gets ready for it. Have you noticed that these two points don't even touch your actual diet? They are about how you eat, not just what you eat. And honestly, many digestive problems don't only come from food itself. They often come from wrong eating habits built up over years. Well, let's say you take a course of pills for two weeks or maybe a month. That's just one month out of, say, 60 years of your life. It's a drop in the ocean. Meanwhile, for decades, your daily habits have been slowly pushing your body toward disease. And then we expect one pill to magically cure us in a few weeks. That's not going to happen if we are talking about chronic or metabolic diseases. Sure, medication can reduce symptoms. It can calm down an acute attack of the disease. But unless you change your routine, your daily lifestyle, your habits, no pill is going to make you truly healthy. Without these changes, relapses will keep coming back. So we should take the same steps, but in reverse, step by step, habit by habit, back toward health. Now, the next point might surprise you, because again, it's not about diet. It's about the temperature of your food. After gallbladder removal, you really need to protect your digestive system. 
Foods that are too cold, like ice cream or icy drinks, can actually increase inflammation in the digestive tract. Digestive enzymes don't work well at very low temperatures. They have an optimal temperature where they function best. That means if you eat very cold food, it breaks down much more slowly. It sits heavier in your stomach, puts stress on your digestive organs, and you feel bloating and heaviness. But it's not only cold food. Very hot food can also be harmful. Extremely hot dishes can damage the mucous membrane of your stomach and intestines, which leads to irritation and over time to inflammation. So you just have to stick with food that's warm or close to room temperature. When it comes to gallbladder problems, there is a ton of advice about what you should eat. In some countries, doctors will recommend you a special diet for a few weeks or even for a few months. But in other places, they don't prescribe any diet at all, claiming there is not enough evidence. And that second approach feels strange, especially if you have cholesterol gallstones. In that case, your diet is what caused the stones in the first place. In lab studies, researchers can cause gallstones in animals in just three weeks, simply by feeding them a high cholesterol diet. For humans, the normal healthy amount of cholesterol is under 350 mg per day. But if you start hitting 700s, you are pretty much guaranteed to develop gallstones. And you might be surprised how little it takes to get there. Here you see this menu. This menu that definitely will cause gallstones. So that's all in sum will give you gallstones. It's really not that much food. So it's strange not to change the diet that led to such a big problem. After gallbladder surgery, you've just lost an entire digestive organ. Sure, you can live without it, but your body doesn't have extra parts lying around, you know. You have a choice. You can either help your digestive system adapt to the new situation with your diet, or you can just keep overloading it and wait to see which organ is going to fail next. That second option doesn't sound very healthy. To feel good, you need to avoid some foods like fatty, smoked or fried food. You especially want to watch out for fatty animal products. Things like fatty cuts of pork, lamb, duck and goose, as well as processed meats like sausages, bacon and ham. Your meat should be lean. The same goes for dairy. Avoid all live fatty products like butter, cream, processed cheese and high fat cheeses. A little bit of vegetable oil is usually okay if it doesn't cause diarrhea. The main goal is to eat food that's easy to digest. It's better to avoid alcohol. It has terrible consequences for your whole entire digestive tract and seriously increases inflammation. Fresh hot bread can be tough on your digestive system. If you are a big bread lover, try to avoid freshly baked bread. Crackers and a little bit stale bread are better. You also shall avoid foods that can really irritate your stomach and intestines, so anything super spicy, too sour or pickled should be probably be off the table. But honestly, the most important rule is that you have to learn to listen to your own body. As you start paying attention, you'll figure out which specific foods make you feel bad. When you identify one, it's best to cut it out, even if it's not on some official bad food list. Sometimes so-called healthy foods may cause problems too. Onions and garlic, for example, can irritate the lining of your stomach. Beans and lentils can cause a lot of gas and bloating. Cabbage, artichokes, asparagus and radishes often do the same thing. Even some fruits or raw uh, green vegetables uh, rich of fibers, like spinach, for example, can be difficult to digest. Right after your surgery, your gastroenterologist may prescribe some medication to help your digestion. This could be something for diarrhea or oppositely for constipation, because people can really experience either one. Uh, they might also give you enzyme medications to help out your pancreas, like pancreatin, or some hepatic protectors, which helps protect your liver from the bile. It's super important to follow your doctor's instructions here. But by sticking to a good diet and following these healthy 
eating habits, you can avoid future attacks and not have to rely on medications all of your life. So to keep the rest of your digestive system healthy and feel good, there are few key rules. First, chew your food well, like really chew it. Eat small meals more often. Aim for five or six small portions a day. If you can eat at regular predictable times, that would be perfect. Room temperature or warm food is the best. And finally, the better you stick to your diet, meaning the less animal fats, hard to digest foods, sweets and pastries you eat, the healthier the rest of your digestive system will stay for a long time. These rules will help you feel good and live a normal life without pain, nausea or diarrhea. You can live a full and happy life even without a gallbladder, but you have to adapt to some new features of your digestion. Don't forget to subscribe, be healthier, and see you in the next videos.